Hello, we're meeting today to discuss an action that the AMFT Board of Directors has recently taken. I'm Jill Bayshore Sidley, Director of Communications and Component Programs. With me today is Shelly Hansen, President of the Board of Directors, and Tracy Todd, Chief Executive Officer. So we're meeting today to discuss an action that the board has recently taken. That's right, Jill. Um, I'm really pleased to share with our members that the Board of Directors recently made the decision that it would be in the association's best interest to sell the Alfred Street building and shift to a more modern and nimble working environment. So reviewing the history of AMFT, I realized this is not the first iteration of AMFT moving or making a transition with its office. Yeah, exactly. Not at all. Um, this is a process AAMFT has embarked on so many times, resulting in many moves. And since AAMFT is financially very strong now, this is not due to any financial trouble. It's just an opportunity to um, best use um, the benefits for the association. Yeah, thank you for the overview. So as I reviewed the history, this is not our first move, is it? <laughs> No, not at all. Uh, this is another iteration. Uh, AAMFT has had many homes. Um, since 1982, when AAMFT moved from California to DC, uh, then there were multiple moves within the DC area and eventually to Alexandria, uh, where it has been um, currently. Uh, so this is really about a strategic and careful uh, process of decision making about the location. Are there any advantages given the nature of our region um, in the DC area? Well, staff reside all around the DC area and, and now we mm -hmm. can have, for example, a co-work location in say Maryland, if we need to, to allow staff to have a shorter commute uh, when they do go to, into the office. And likewise, the staff residing in Southern areas of the DC area could have a separate co-work location. Uh, we can still have a central co-work location where we have staff work for large meetings or staff meetings and governance functions. The, the flexibility is just quite advantageous. Yeah, certainly given the nature of our region. So why did the board decide that selling the building would be the best course of action? Um, what factors were considered in that de decision for AMFT moving forward? That's a great question. Um, really, it's about our fiduciary responsibility for AAMFT and its assets. Um, it, it, that is one of our chief responsibilities of the AAMFT Board of Directors. So we reviewed um, professional real estate uh, consultants documents and reports, financial advisors reports, um, along with some input from AAMFT staff. And the board determined that the building is no longer serving as a low risk high reward asset as part of the overall investment portfolio. What were some of the key risks that stood out in that analysis? Well, there were a, a number, I'll, I'll highlight three that are very important. Uh, the increased risk of tenant vacancy and associated costs. So we've mm -hmm. all just lived through COVID. So you can imagine um, that mm -hmm. Some people aren't going into the workplace, right? So if a, if a tenant decides, I, we can't do this, we don't have anybody coming in, um, AAMFT absorbs uh, the cost of that uh, rent. So that is uh, an expensive risk factor for AAMFT. Um, we also have an advancing age of the building. And um, then finally, we have a window of high return on the building investment um, is likely close uh, in the near term. And Tracy, I know DC, like many other cities, is making transitions with staffing and employment patterns. Can you elaborate on that and how it affects AMFT? That, that is also a good question, Jill. The staffing patterns in the DC area have been changing pretty rapidly over the last several years, and COVID, of course, accelerated that. But prior to COVID, there has been a big move to, if you will, get out of the mindset of butts in the chair and into the mindset of work being done. And that has really shifted how organizations have to think about their space. So no longer do you have to have people sitting in the office in order to get it done. And this directly relates to basically competition for the talent pool. 
if you're going to have more of a traditional office and you're going to have these rigid office policies, you're not going to be competitive for the high quality talent that you want to have. So you have to make the adaptation. And when you look at EMFT in DC, DC is consistently in the top five of worst commutes, top five cities of expensive housing, and those two play off of one another. So people who live outside the beltway, as we refer to it, can have affordable housing, but then guess what? They've got horrible commutes, 60, 90 minutes one way. And work-life balance issues have hit hard in the DC area, which is a very good thing in my opinion, because do you want your staff spending an hour and a half in their car, or would you rather have them go 10 minutes to a co-work location, go to work, work there and then go back home and spend time with their family. Where, where do you want that? So that work-life balance has really emerged in the DC area. You have the cost of housing, you have the cost of travel, all of that starts to play into really competing for your talent pool. The other variable that has changed significantly is what type of work is being done. It used to be you have to sit in a cubicle to do your work. Now you have a whole lot more collaboration being done. You have work teams working on things. You have staff working in teams with volunteers. There's a whole host of collaboration that is now part of the everyday work process. And having someone sit their butt in a cubicle is not how the work is getting done anymore. So you have to have this bigger collaborative type of space. Now, how that impacts us is really in terms of costs. If we wanna reconfigure, keep our building and reconfigure AMFT space so that it's, it does meet the design of collaboration, well, we've got too much space. We don't need all that space and it would cost well over $100,000 to do that. Now consider tenants. If we have tenants who decide to move out and then tenants move in, we have to redesign that space. So the whole idea of what is involved in space has radically changed. For us, this has all been something we've been looking at because it was planned in 2023 that we would reevaluate the building, the space, and was it meeting our need? COVID simply accelerated that. It didn't create it, it simply accelerated it. Shelly, what kind of risk-benefit analysis was conducted by the board? Yeah, um, the board, uh, with the assistance of the auditors, the real estate consultants, and staff conduct, conducted a risk and benefit analysis, um, which you can review, um, members, in the FTM. Uh, but I, I want to highlight a few very specific items. Um, one area of escalating risk is the aging building, as I mentioned. Um, Recently, uh, in just the last few years, for example, the HVAC needed a major overhaul. Um, that was a charge of an excess of 300,000 in repairs. And that's not even including the yearly annual repairs uh, to keep it working. Um, as you can see, and as a board, we would rather that money be going towards something that benefits the overall association, et cetera. So that is a, a factor that really uh, weighed in is the age of the building. Um, another expensive piece was the elevator. Um, we have spent nearly $250,000 in repairs on the elevator. Uh, so these factors of an aging building become very real and very pragmatic to look at. A second area of risk really is the attractiveness of the building in terms of selling. Um, while the property values have been increasing over the lifetime of our ownership as AAMFT, the DC marketplace is very attractive right now at this time due to the expansion of the Amazon headquarters next to Alexandria. Amazon's opening a campus attracts a wide variety of businesses. I, I come from the Pacific Northwest. I'm very near Nike. I know this really well. There are a lot of ancillary businesses that come along with some of these really great big giant corporations. So a wide variety of businesses that complement and benefit Amazon are placing AAMFT's building in a very positive position right now. Alexandria is experiencing benefit directly. So with the changes in the real estate market due to COVID, shifts in the workplace dynamics and the models, um, we were advised that the value of the building is likely looking at a peak right now. 
And as a staff person in the building, I know one challenge I've witnessed is, you know, if something goes wrong in the building, it pulls staff away from working on AMFT matters onto business items. Did that play any role in the decision? Oh, absolutely. I mean, in my personal memory, I can remember the, the air conditioning going out and it was like 95 degrees with 86% humidity. How do you ask 45 people to sit inside a building doing work and do the computers keep working? So yes, um, the reality is that our building um, makes little to no profit every year and it and is at risk for loss this year. So we simply can't afford building management staff or services uh, like most larger office buildings have. Um, our staff who are association managers by training and trade have really done a fabulous job. Um, but I'll be honest, um, it's kept me up a bit at night thinking about, is this an effective use of the association's time resources, which include money and the expertise of our staff. So this applies both to uh, my mindset as the president of the board and as a general board member. Um, do we really want our staff distracted by building matters, playing landlord or focusing on the association? I know personally, which one I, I lean towards the association. Um, so put plainly, does it serve the memberships in the way that we want to be a landlord? Um, this highlights a benefit to selling the building. The staff will be solely working for the association, benefiting members and the profession. So as the building has aged, it's always uh, a challenge to hear about our CEO and senior staff needing to turn their attention away from the members and the association because of repairs or other distractions related to the building. I've asked myself many times, is this how our members want them to be spending their time? And speaking of risks and benefits, Tracy, what are the advantages? If AMFT sells, we either need to lease or buy space. So can you talk a little bit more about how that might better position us? Uh, yes, the leasing is really um, a, an ability to be much more nimble. AMFT prides itself in being nimble in its management. The board is nimble in how it operates. Staff tries to be as nimble as possible. And so, Leasing gives us that nimbleness, as Shelly was just saying. We don't have to run off and take care of an HVAC system. We don't have to take care of a fire pump. We don't have to do certain things. So it gives us that nimbleness. The other part that the leasing does is it gives us some flexibility. If you think about the evolution of an office space, for many, many years, everybody had a private office, their own door, closed door. And that was what it was for many years. Then that shifted to a cubicle. Everybody had a cubicle. That lasted a while, but then that gave way to the whole open office and you had you know, the high tech firms who had their open office space. But that also gave way to sort of a hybrid of cubicle, open office, and then remote work. We don't know what the next iteration is. And so what would we do with this space in five years or 10 years when another way of operating is, and people could say, well, you just, do what you usually do? And the answer is you can't if you want to compete for the labor pool. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to keep up. And then if you have tenants, every new tenant is going to have a reconfiguration, a build out. That build out costs a lot of money and costs you months of rent, costs you dollars in the build out, and it takes years to recoup that money. And as Shelly said, it's not a big profit making venture. So you could have a tenant move in after it's been vacant for a number of months, paid for the build out, and it could take three, four, five, six years to even make up those costs in terms of a profit. So the important question that we can do with the lease is we can find a way to really customize what AMFT wants. And there are two factors. Number one is how much space do you really need? And what type of space do you need? So when you think about it, in the old days, you have a cubicle, one person, eight hours a day, five days a week. Today, with remote work, you could have one cubicle, theoretically, and have someone coming in one day per week. You could have five people on that cubicle. Okay? Well, you've just reduced your space by 80% because five people are using one space instead of five different people using five different spaces. So it's the type of space that you have as well as the amount of space. Leasing allows us that kind of flexibility. And what are the costs involved in leasing? Well, the costs, that's where really 
that's where the hard work came in and having to use our specialists and the consultants and things like that. And what we did is looked at basically four scenarios. And the first scenario is keeping the building and keeping everything as is. In that scenario, we had the estimate from the, the consulting firms was probably a cost of about $700,000 over 11 years. And that cost is related to tenants. Would the tenants move out? Would you have the rebuild? Would you have vacancy for a couple of months? So that's an immediate cost of about 700,000 in the red. And that doesn't get into what AMFT would have to do in terms of reconfiguring its space. So that was option number one, call that our baseline option cost of 700,000. Option number two was basically selling the building and then going out and finding space and renting about 75% of the space that we currently have. And of course, that's all dependent upon your neighborhood, the community you're renting from or renting in. And in that scenario, over 11 years, the, the savings would be anywhere from 500,000 to $1.1 million. So you go from a loss of 700,000 to 500,000, 1.1 million on the plus side. Option number three was sell the building and then go and find lease space of 50% of what we're currently using. Again, looking at different neighborhoods, that is anywhere from about a 1.1 million to 1.5 million in terms of savings. So selling the building and leasing either 50% or 75% is instantly about a $1 million savings over 11 years. But we've then explored the fourth option and that was the co-working location type of situation. For those of you who don't know what co-working is, it's the WeWork concept where you go and you basically subscribe to an office and you get exactly what it is you want. So if we had a number of staff living out west of the Beltway, we could go get a co-working location there that would allow three, four, five staff to have an office if they wanted to use that office one, two, three days a week, however many days we would agree on. And we can still, as Shelly mentioned, have a central co-working location that has a conference room, a team room, allows you to do the collaboration, et cetera. It gives you that flexibility. When we ran the option and the numbers of a co-working location over 11 years, now the savings is in excess of $2.5 million over 11 years. When we take a look at the finances of $2.5 million on the plus or $700,000 on the minus side, the numbers really told the story. So when you combine the numbers with the competitive labor pool, work-life balance issues, this fell into that category of it's a no-brainer. And for me as a CEO, making any other decision would seem financially irresponsible. So that leads to the question that's on everyone's mind is what will AMF do with the proceeds of the sale? Um, since we have no debt, this will result in a substantial influx of money into the association. Yeah, it will. <laughs> and <laughs> that's a very good question um, because AMFT is so financially secure and has been for so long. As a matter of fact, we had the board approve a $1.2 million development fund and an auditor said, hooray, finally you're spending more money on the association. And that was $1.2 million. We have a huge savings and we are so financially sound. It, it is it's great. And you have to have money for a rainy day. Okay? You have to have money for the emergency such as a COVID pandemic that could hurt the association. Um, a legal lawsuit such as we had down in Texas. You have to have some money set into reserves and we will have money in reserves, but we will have way too much money in our reserves and we will have to figure out what we're gonna do with that. And we will have a plan to the board for their July consideration. I can't tell you exactly what the plan is, but I can tell you the qualities that will be in those expenditures. The first thing is, is that MFG will not use these proceeds to go and spend it on some shiny object, some sort of pet project that sounds really exciting and benefits a very small segment of our membership or the profession. Not, that's off the table. There's no shiny objects being chased. The second thing is that is off the table also is that it's not going to result in a permanent cost to AMFT. What I mean by that is we could spend a lot of money investing in whatever the proceeds are. We could spend it all. 
But then what happens when that money's gone and AMFT is stuck with the bill to maintain it? Whatever it is we spent it on, AMFT now has to cover those bills, that, that cost. That's a permanent cost as a result of these proceeds. And so we've gone from what could be a very strong position that we're in to over time when those proceeds are gone and strapping AMFT with some huge expenses, making AMFT very vulnerable. That's not going to happen. That's off the table. What we will have as a quality is a long-term benefit that we will look at for AMFT, our members, the practice, and the profession. And we'll have to explore the best options for expenditure of the proceeds, but it is going to be things that will hopefully put us into the same category with like the NASWs and the APAs that have these huge budgets and can do certain really good high quality projects that are, you know, have a lifetime of five, 10, 15, 20 years and benefit the practice and the profession, but at the same time, do not become a cost center after the codes are gone. So I can't see exactly what we're spending it on, but I can tell you the qualities of those expenditures and what they are and what they are not. Sure, and I'd now like to invite you to share any closing thoughts as we wrap up our discussion. My closing thought is, is that I think that we've got to be able to be managing staff quickly, nimbly, and meet the work-life balance you know, we're all family therapists. We know the importance of the family. We know the importance of self-care. And the, the trend and the projection is, is that there's got to be more of that if we want to be competitive with our labor pool. And the heck with being competitive with the labor pool as a former family therapist, that's just good for our family and good for our staff. And so I really look at it is that this is really good for the staff. It's really good for the membership. And as Shelly has commented on the aging of the building, it's going to become a cost center. So this is good for the association, the practice and the profession. I see it as basically a no brainer at this point. And I would say on behalf of the board of directors, you know, uh, we were given a tremendous amount of material to digest and to really have a thoughtful discussion and, and in order to make this decision. So we're actually very excited about this because we can see the benefits for the membership for the association for long-term. Thank you both, Shelly and Tracy. Thank you. Take care, have a good night.